All right, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, today's, uh, let's get started. Today's actually, I'm gonna bring a topic about containers from scratch. Uh, what are they made from? Actually, tonight is my first ever talk in Jakarta, so my hand's a bit shaky. <laughs> Probably there, there will be a typo later. Uh, forgive me with that. Yes, as Ibrahim mentioned, uh, we are friends probably since three years back. Uh, I also went to his marriage last month. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we went to the Bay Area together. Uh, probably some of you know Bay Area as Silicon Valley. Uh, yeah, so prior to joining Gojek, um, I used to work for a company called VMware and Pivotal. I helped starting a project called Pivotal Container Service with Google. So this project is actually a collaboration between th three, uh, three companies, VMware, Pivotal, and Google. Uh, so I spent uh, about two years there. Uh, and then uh, Imre asked me to go home, so I was following, he following him to come back home and then join Gojek, whereas he joined Traveloka. Um, I worked for Gojek on GoPay core infrastructure team. This is actually my terminology. Internally, we refer to this as GoPay system. But externally, uh, most of you know system as core infrastructure work. So most of the works are around Kubernetes. We hack Kubernetes internals. We also hack uh, Docker internals. We use, uh, we use Docker extensively and LXC uh, in our container platform. All right. so. Uh, yeah, this talk is actually inspired by an Instructables uh, article, how to build your own smartphone. Uh, is there anyone here have ever built your own smartphone? Probably my friend over there. He was a robotics engineer. Deepta, raise your hand. Have you built uh, your own smartphone? <laughs> OK. So inside these Instructables uh, articles, uh, it is actually a, a practical DIY for you to build your own uh, smartphone. There are a couple of ingredients that you can buy maybe here from Glodok. Glodok or Manga Dua. I'm, I'm original from Bandung. In Bandung, you can get these parts very easily. I don't know in Jakarta where to get this from. So uh, the ingredients for building smartphones are you can have Raspberry Pi, uh, GSM Breakout, GSM Anten Electric Microphone, 1200 uh, mAh lithium ion battery. So, don't worry, we're not going to build a smartphone tonight. But instead of building smartphone, we're going to build a container without a container at time. So we're not going to be using Docker. We're not going to be using LXC. We're not going to be using Rocket. We're just going to be uh, using the built-in uh, Linux kernel features, which already enable us uh, creating our own container, actually. I want to know a little bit of your background first. Uh, how many of you have been using Docker every day, day-to-day -day basis? 20%-ish. Um, how about Alexi? Oh, awesome. Yeah, cool. And Rocket? No one's using Rocket yet. OK, cool. So um, yeah, I'm going to do a demo a lot, so I might need a help for Imre to hold the mic. Yella. <laughs> All right. So um, I have 30 minutes. The first ingredient, um, before moving forward, um, we will have to know what exactly a container image is. What are the images that you guys download over the internet? Like what happened when you do Docker pull something, or in your Docker file you do from Ubuntu or from Alpine, from something else. So there is nothing but, but, but a tarball. The tarball that contains two uh, main things actually here. The first thing is uh, the application metadata. So in Docker file, uh, you can specify what, um, what sort of executable commands that, you, that your container will start upon startup. Also, what uh, are the environment variables that your container expose and other sort of things. That's application metadata is actually a, uh, a specification on how do you want to run the, uh, the, the app inside the, the container. The second main thing is actually the container file system. 
the container file system is actually where your app resides. So if you have a, if you have a, Go, a Golang code, you, you build the, the Golang executable binary, and then you, you put it inside this container file system. And there is also a, a thing very similar to operating system, actually. If you do ls inside the container, the file system is, is super similar to, to operating system, right? There's a, there's a bin, there's a shared library, lib64, and, and, and so forth. But uh, the difference is that this container final, uh, file system doesn't have kernel, obviously, and it doesn't have uh, init system. It, it's kind of scary, right? If, if a container can have its own init system and then it kind of break the whole containers in the host. So um, building container image itself is a huge topic. I'm not going to bring, uh, bring it up here tonight. But there's a, there's a couple of uh, options. Or, or, or great tools for you to build minimal Linux container. There's a thing called build root. There's a thing called the bootstrap. This is based off uh, Debian, uh, Debian operating system. So what it does, it's, it's actually uh, telling, Debian, telling the, the, the Debian system to, uh, to bake, uh, base Debian system into a subdirectory. This is where uh, the, the container uh, file system starts from. And then there's also a thing, uh, yum, which is you are very familiar with and a DNF, which is based on uh, Fedora. So this is very similar to the bootstrap, but it's, it's a Fedora. There's also Gentoo and Builda. If you have question, my friend over there can help me <laughs> answer that question. But today, um, what I tried at home, uh, I was using a DNF on my Fedora machine. It's, it's a pretty advanced tool. So this is what, uh, what you do. You define a subdirectory. Um, root FS, for example, root file system, and then tell DNF to install base uh, Fedora system into the root FS subdirectory here, and then it's all a bunch of stuff like you usually do in, in your Linux system. Because I do, uh, this is a very minimal system, I told DNF to install Python 3, install IP root, which, and everything else on top of the base system. All of those systems, all of those file systems are recited uh, inside this root FS subject. Actually, I'm going to show you. I have a Vagrant machine here. Actually, uh, running the NF here might be very slow. It's, uh, you might feel bored. So I cheated. I actually already did it at home. So here I have a root FS subdirectory here. Yeah, I have a root FS subdirectory here. If you pick inside, it's very similar to an operating system, right? It has a, a bin directory here, which is, uh, which is not the host bin, but this is the root fs slash bin. There's also um, a shared library here. Oh, it's, it, it only has one shared library. Anyway, yeah, that's the, the root fs uh, file system that I built using DNF. That was the first ingredient. Now. We go to the exciting part. Ingredient number two, uh, chroot. Does anyone ever heard about chroot before? All right, uh, you guys can <laughs> help me. <laughs> so chroot, uh, what it does, chroot is, is, is a syscall, basically. It accepts one argument, which is a, a directory. So you tell chroot um, uh, which directory you want to start your process view to the file system from. So for, for instance, uh, no, actually here, we are trapping a process view to the file system. So uh, for example, um, uh, I did ch root, uh, root fs and then run a bin bash process here. This will, uh, this will restrict uh, the bin bash process view to inside the root fs only. So if you execute this, if you do ls uh, on the root, this is actually, the slash is actually starting from the root fs directory. Does this make sense? This is what, uh, what makes it an illusion that uh, this process start from the root fs uh, directory. Although this is ls slash, but in the host, this slash is actually mapped to the root fs directory. Make sense? So if you do uh, which Python here, uh, inside this CH root, or inside this container, I should say, inside this container, it says the Python is coming from slash usr slash bin slash Python. 
but actually this is from slash root fs slash user slash bin slash python. Make sense? Okay. Now, um, but the bad thing is this is nothing but a simple CS root, which is a, a view limitation on the file system. So if you run ps aux from inside this container, oops, uh, we need to do some magic before doing this. We'll do ps aux. It's actually going to show all the processes running on the host. So this is very bad, right? This is very bad. If we open another terminal, this is uh, again back to host. Um, if I run top here, right? I'm running top uh, process on the host, but from inside the container, uh, I can see the process here, top. And because, because I executed CS root with a sudo, this is obviously a root, so it has a privilege to kill this top process running on host. If you go back to the host, it's gone. So this is really bad. That's why, um, that's why, that's why we talk about namespaces. Has anyone ever heard about namespaces before? Okay, pretty good. So uh, you can think in this namespace. Uh, I shouldn't say that. So uh, in, when you execute CS root, you limit the view of the file system, right? You can think this namespace as a CS root for other subsystems in Linux. So for example, uh, if you go to the Linux documentation, there's at least six or seven namespaces. PJ, six, seven? Yeah, there's a couple. <laughs> uh, this is the common uh, namespace. There's a process namespace, which will isolate the process of, uh, of your container. There's a network namespace which will isolate your network, uh, network interfaces of container. There's also a mount namespace which will limit the view of a container against mount bindings in the whole system. So uh, yeah, you can think of this as a CS root of other system. CS root of process trees, CS root of network interfaces, CS root of mount blocks. The sys calls related to these uh, namespaces that uh, I'm going to demonstrate uh, soon is, is clone. So that all the all the child processes that are forked from the from the parent process runs inside the, the namespaces that you executed on. And the second syscall is unshare. Uh, unshare is a syscall uh, that accepts uh, kind of bit arguments, like which which namespace do you want this process to to run on? There's a there's a good bash utility utility also called uh, unshare. I'm gonna show you. Uh, so, so earlier we, we ran ch root uh, bare bone without this unshare. Right now we're gonna specify, uh, we're gonna tell kernel to run bin bash in a new process namespace. Dash p means uh, run this on, 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 a, on a new process namespace. And then you have to fork. Uh, this dash f means uh, run the child process uh, under this process tree. And then we mount the, the proc uh, back, root f slash proc. And then uh, after this unshare, you run the ch root here, bin bash. Now we are inside the container. Um, we are inside the container that only has a uh, process namespace, actually. But earlier I showed you if you do ps aux, uh, the container can see the whole process in the, in, in the system, right? Right now, it's a little bit funny because usually uh, PID1 is the init system of the Linux system. But here, uh, because we, we tell the kernel uh, to, to execute the bin bash inside a new process namespace, the, this process thinks that thinks itself as PID number one instead of uh, init system, as in the whole system. And uh, the thing that you should know also, the host, the concept of host, host should know all the processes running inside its own host. So all the, all the processes running in all containers inside this host are actually available in the host. If you play around with, uh, with uh, Docker at home later on, you can actually see here, here. But, uh, but if you run top here, 
because uh, this guy is running in a separate process namespace, it won't be seen here. OK. Uh, that's ingredient number three. Now we have, uh, now we have um, existing uh, bin bash process in the process namespace. How do we enter? Uh, actually, before enter, I want to show you that namespaces are actually composable. As you can see here, uh, I only ran bin bash inside a process namespace uh, without enabling uh, the, the, the remaining namespaces, like network namespace, mount namespace. I only ran uh, this guy in a process namespace. So similarly, a good example of this composable namespaces are a Kubernetes pod. How many of you have tried Kubernetes at least? Still, many of you haven't tried Kubernetes, are you sure? I know there are so many of you who <laughs> OK. So um, for, 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 for you guys who have tried Kubernetes, uh, you must be familiar with a, with a term, terminology called, called Kubernetes pod. So this is an example of a Kubernetes pod. Uh, it has one cont uh, pause container and one uh, process containers. Actually, this is a, this is going to be a deep dive. If you guys are interested, you can you can talk to me later. A Kubernetes pod was actually uh, started by a pause container before these two containers are uh, starting. So this, uh, uh, if you do kubectl deploy a Kubernetes pod, there will be pause container coming up, and then wait for it to get assigned an IP. And then once the IP is set, the pause container will die. So even though inside the Kubernetes pod you don't see pause container, if you go to the host, you go, uh, you do Docker PS, you can see a bunch of pause containers there. That's the reason for it. And then this pause container will die. The our container applications will come up inside the Kubernetes pod. So if you see here, there's an interesting thing here here inside the Kubernetes pod. Uh, we see three containers. This. Three containers, uh, I should say, three different processes and three different uh, CH root. But uh, the interesting thing here is it only has one network interface. This means this guy are sharing the same network namespace. So a Kubernetes pod is nothing but uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of containers sharing the same network namespace and mount namespace. That's why inside the Kubernetes, uh, if you mount a pod, all the containers inside this pod can see that mount pod. That's the reason of it. They, uh, all of them are sharing the mount namespace. Make sense? So uh, I'm going to show you how to enter uh, our existing container. In Docker world, probably Docker XX something, or kubectl XX something, to enter the existing container. Uh, the syscall is called set ns. Uh, there's, a, there's a good bash utility that wraps around this set ns syscall, but it's not called uh, set ns. It's called nsn. Now, the question is, um, how do you find out uh, which, uh, what namespace our process is running on? So uh, we are back to our host. This is our host, right? No? This is no? OK, this is the container. This is the host. So if you go back to the host, um, the PID of that uh, bash process is this one. And uh, Linux actually stores this information inside the slash proc, uh, slash proc uh, file path, followed by PID, and then namespace. Oops, I should do this. So this is all where all the namespaces information are located on for each uh, process ID. So the thing with, that we, uh, as, as you can see here, there's this MNT namespace, C group namespace, PID namespace associated to the PID. This PID is associated to our bin bash container that are running in the other terminal. Uh, OK, oh, what were I? About to do uh, NS enter. NS enter. Uh, you specify the PID. Oops. What was the PID number? Two two seven one. Then you specify the mount so that the so that this NS enter can can get the existing proc. 
file that gets mounted to this uh, guy, which is MNT. And then you do ch root, uh, root fs bin bash. I don't know why uh, we have to add this every time. So now uh, I'm able to successfully enter the existing uh, namespaces that are associated with this 2271 uh, process, which is being best process. So if you do ps aux uh, in the container here, we were able to see two bin bash process here. This is myself, one, and then this is the other one that uh, are running on my other terminal. Obviously, since both of these guys are running in the same process namespace, if I run top from here, for example, it's going to be shown here, right? And then I'm able to kill this guy. Yeah. OK. Huh? Is it too fast? Yes. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm going to slow down a little bit from now. This is ingredient number five. Uh, now we are having existing uh, CH root process. Now, how do we inject files into our existing uh, CH root file system? So, you guys must be familiar with this uh, code snippet. Uh, Docker run, blah, blah, blah. And then there's this flag, dash v flag. Nginx dash vol, colon, slash usr, slash share, slash nginx, slash HTML. Can anyone tell me what is this doing? Docker expert? Docker expert, tell me. Uh, actually, it's going to create a mon, uh, volume mon to the host. So basically, we'll be able to access the file system located in the host. Uh, sorry, directory located in the host from the container. And uh, the other way around, right? Yeah, that's correct. So this is going to map nginx dash vol uh, path in the host to the container. Uh, file path here, which is slash HTML. Similarly, in, in Kubernetes manifest, uh, there's a thing called volume mounts here, which is actually uh, mounting to the path. Uh, in, in my case, this is a host path. So the pod, uh, as I show you, pod contains uh, multiple containers. All those containers are going to see slash data on the host on their slash test uh, dash pd inside their container. Make sense? Am I too slow now? <laughs> OK. Now the question is, uh, how are we going to do this in our current demo? So uh, there's a thing called mount bind, this mount bind thing. So mount bind, uh, you can think mount bind as a symlink, but not a symlink. So if you do symlink, if you do symlink from the host to the container, it doesn't make sense, right? Because the container cannot see the file system of the host. So it's not going to work. So this is more advanced than that. Than that. It's, a, it's like a symlink, but white uh, it's, a, it's a white system. So uh, here, I'm going to create a, a directory here called read only files. OK. And then I'm going to write a file. Hello from Gojek. OK. Wait, actually, this is container or host? Oh, both are containers, actually. So it's wrong. It's supposed to be here. MKD read only files. Huh? Da. Is this good enough? Okay, uh, one, two, three. Is it too big? Okay, so um, hello from Gojek. <laughs> okay, uh, and then from inside the container, I'm going to create a, a, a file that will be the mount point of the things that we're going to do. 
mkdir var. For example, I'm making the mom, mom point inside this slash far. Is it good? Yeah, good. And then we're going to run this uh, mount bind. I'm going to cheat because I don't remember. I can't type this long. What was the PID number again? 2271. Actually, let me use 2271. Here, uh, we are doing NS Enter again. Uh, this, this second tab, we were back to the host, right? Mati <laughs> gan. Okay. Uh, yeah, we are entering uh, the existing mount namespace here. And then uh, do a mount bind with a read only. This means RO means read only. Can anyone guess uh, what are these two doing? So it's actually a binding. Do a mount binding of the read only file path in the host to our root FS, var read only files, which are currently being used by uh, the other terminal. And then uh, this is from inside the terminal. We can now see there's a high file here. So we know now that um, our mount bind is successful. We can also see, see this uh, successfully. But this is a read only. How do we prove it? Uh, let's try to write something. Awesome, go pay. <laughs> Yeah, it's a read-only file system. So this works. OK. The next thing is C groups. OK, uh, so the things that we have seen so far are actually a restriction on a view of a process, right? We haven't really uh, seen how do we restrict resources uh, for a process. This is where C groups come into picture. C groups is another uh, uh, namespace. C group is another namespace, OK. <coughs> Which limit resources? Pegang uh, lagi. So this C group information is, uh, is managed by the system inside this slash sys slash fs slash c group. So if you do this, uh, you can see there's a bunch of c group types here. There's a c group CPU, there's c group memory, c group PIDs, and so forth. Uh, yeah. So uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to show you uh, how to create a memory sub c group. Uh, the way we do is simply we create a directory inside this uh, memory. Uh, what is memory subsecret? What is memory subsecret? Uh, I'll show you. Okay. <laughs> this is why I'm doing this. OK. Uh, so this memory C group is nothing but will limit uh, memory resources used by a process that I'm going to uh, show you soon. So I'm creating a demo. Uh, memory sub C group here. The kernel system automatically populates uh, this with a bunch of necessary files. There's a memory limit in bytes, memory swappiness. Can you guys hear me? I'm going to shout a little bit. All right. Uh, yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Inject 100, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Can anyone guess uh, what is this number? So I'm, I'm injecting 100 megabyte. It's a limit in bytes, right? 100 megabyte of memory C group. And then I'm also going to do, I'm going to disable the memory swap. 
uh, swappiness. Okay. Can anyone guess what I'm trying to do here? Can you guess what I'm trying to do here? So I have 100 megabyte of limit, memory limit, and I have turned on memory swap. So when the process ran out of memory, uh, it will just be dead because there will be no uh, data being swapped into the hard disk. Um, yeah. The way we assign a process to a C group is we assign our own uh, process ID to uh, this guy, slash sys, slash fs, slash C group, slash memory, slash demo, slash task. OK, so if we cat this file, all the processes with this PID are assigned to our demo memory sub C group. And then for the demo purpose, I have a hungry code written in Python. Can anyone know what is this trying to do? It's actually uh, running forever, consuming your memory forever. But since I already assigned my own process to, uh, to, to the demo C group, it's actually located in this. Our process is already associated with memory sub C group, mem also memory demo sub C group. So if you run this hungry Python code, we'll see what's going on. It keeps consuming the memory, 40 MB, 50 MB, 60 MB, and then it will get killed like that. It's, it's cool, right? I can see your face fascinated. Because we, uh, we limit uh, the, the memory to 100 megabytes. So before this guy nuking the, the, our, our machine, nuking all the containers running in the host, because of the C group, we limit the available resources that this current process can use. All right. Uh, actually, since the time is running out, I'm going to skip. Uh, now we'll get to talk about the container security. Uh, there's a quote from Dan Walsh. He's an engineer at Red Hat. He said, Docker is about running random code downloaded from the internet and running it as root. So it's kind of scary, right? That's why container security is very, very important. There's a bunch of uh, security features of the Linux system. There's IC Linux, SecComp, AppArmor. But I'm not going to talk about that because it's kind of hard to demo. So I'm going to talk uh, about Linux capabilities instead. If you guys are interested, uh, open up the link. I'm going to show you. Uh, I, have a, I have a Go code here. It's a very simple Go that will listen uh, to a TCP port 80. I'm going to go out from, the, from my sudo. I'm going to build that, uh, uh, that Go thing. So if I run this executable binary, since we're not uh, a privileged user, right? this is obviously permission denied. And we can obviously uh, easily fix this by uh, running sudo before TMP listen, but that is not fun, right? That is not the purpose of this demo. And for instance, if we have one uh, executable, executable binary like this, and this guy only needs a permission to bind to AT port, why the heck we, we have to uh, give him the whole permission as sudo? That doesn't make sense, right? So this is where Linux capabilities come into picture. Um, I'm going to cheat again. So these Linux capabilities are actually uh, splitting what a, a, a privileged user can do into a, a small granular uh, capabilities. That's why it's, it's called Linux capabilities. Here, I'm granting this TMP listen uh, executable binary a capability to bind to a port in the host. So as you can see here, uh, if I do get cap tmp listen, 
this TMP listen has one capability, which is uh, binding to the service. So if we run again the listen executable binary, as a non-privileged user, this will succeed. It's cool, right? Yeah. Linux is cool. Uh, now, I'm going to try to uh, do a sudo and then run a, and then show you that this guy has a bunch of capabilities. It's uh, yeah, obviously it's a root, right? It has a lot of capabilities that that makes it a root, <laughs> that makes it a privileged user. It has a chown, uh, it has a capwick alarm, and so forth. Now, since our container is usually running as a root, instead of injecting the capabilities one by one, it's usually useful if we uh, strip the capabilities one by one, right? So I'm going to show you here that uh, I'm going to cap sh. I'm going to drop. Siap gun. I'm going to drop the ch1 capability of my root, and then uh, I'm going to create a file. For example, foo. I'm going to try to uh, change the user group of this foo, which is not permitted, because I already dropped the ch1 capability of my root user. Now, uh, since the time is running out, I have two more ingredients, actually, but you can try at home. This is a network namespace. Uh, network namespace, uh, you have your own IP address. You have your own uh, low-pack interface. You can have an a IP address that get to talk to each other. There's a fancier a network namespace demo on my GitHub, but this might be a, another one-hour talk, <laughs> probably next talk. Um, yeah, so uh, the conclusion, containers are just a combination between Linux kernel features. So all the capabilities, all the features that I've already shown you are actually already a Linux built-in features. A container runtime like Docker, Rocket, or LXC, or something else are actually just an opinionated wrapper around these technologies. I'm not actually recommending you to build your own container at time. But my hope is that, uh, that you guys already learn this, uh, this demo. When you guys use Docker or Alexi at home or at workplace, you get a better understanding on how to debug a Docker container and, and, and other stuff. Uh, that's all. This is uh, obviously a compilation of uh, a lot of links, a lot of references. I heavily borrowed a lot of. Uh, content from Eric Chiang, he's a core engineer, he's an awesome guy. There's a good uh, extensive uh, tutorial how to build minimal container by Brian Redbeard. And uh, namespaces in operation, C groups, and there's an interesting project in GitHub called uh, Boker, or Bo Boker, Boker, which is essentially a, a Docker implemented in just 100 lines of bash. Uh, you guys should take a look. It's, it's very interesting. I'm going to share the slides on the, on the Meetup comments uh, later on. Uh, thank you so much. If you guys have questions, feel free uh, to reach me on, on my email. And our team is hiring. If you guys are uh, interested, talk to me. And there's a couple of friends from my team as well that you guys can talk to. Thank you. Uh, OK, thank you. Uh, so uh, I will open up for two questions for now, because uh,